All right. Greetings, everyone. Daniel here with Matt McManus, which uh, has been a long time coming. Matt's a very prolific uh, writer for Jacobin, uh, a, a voice on the left, I think, that has been clarifying the uh, the far right. Um, he, he writes a lot about the political right and its historical uh, foothold and evolution. And I've actually gained a lot from reading Matt's work. So his next major work is on liberal, is kind of an argument for liberal socialism. And I think for a lot of folks on the left, obviously to call somebody a liberal is a pejorative, right? I mean, if you're a Marxist, it's very kind of almost intuitive, right, Matt, that you say, oh, don't be a liberal, right? Mm -hmm. And so immediately you have a Sisyphean task that you set out for yourself <laughs> because we have a common sense on the left. And then, of course, there's the other almost like psychoanalytic dimension of, all right, um, one says that they're left, but secretly they're the effect of what they stand for is liberal. Mm -hmm. So you're screwed in both ways. And then you have the historical facts of <clears throat> Marxian dialectics and how Marx related to the bourgeois class. Mm -hmm. You have the dimension of, you know, this question of solidarity. We have um, this idea of working class emancipation at the center of the Marxist tradition, but how can bourgeois class interests facilitate or form partnerships with the goal of working class emancipation? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to engage with liberals. You have to take on the liberal question. Um, and sometimes it becomes hysterical and very hard to do that. So let's start off, Matt, with, um, with your, your vision here. Um, what, where did the idea come from to make this argument? Obviously, folks like Mill have been making this argument mm -hmm. over 100 years ago. Um, so I guess it's there is a lineage, there is a tradition. Um, what is your lineage and tradition? And what made you want to make this plea uh, for liberal socialism? Yeah, well, first off, yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, I agree this has been a long time coming. So I appreciate the fact that we can finally have this dialogue. Um, but, you know, I wanted to start out by saying I empathize with a lot of the people who, when they hear the label, go, you know, what question mark uh, or even, you know, Oof, what kind of thing is that? Uh, because there's certainly in the United States a kind of liberal personality, a person who identifies as a liberal who thinks that one's political horizon shouldn't extend any further than what an upper middle class person in New York thinks is appropriate. Right. Uh, I've encountered that a lot. It's extremely annoying. Uh, and it does have this reactionary dimension. And we need to be very critical of this. Uh, I also have many criticisms of my own of the liberal tradition philosophically and historically. Uh, and, you know, that's not just, you know, me saying words. People can go back and read my books like um, Liberalism and Liberal Rights, a critical legal argument, which is you know, a 300 page critique of the liberal tradition, particularly in its classical variants. What changed my mind in many respects uh, were two things. Right. Uh, one, you know, I entered my Ph.D. at York University, you know, suffused with Nietzsche and Heidegger. Uh, and then also, you know, very, very heavily embedded in Marx and Foucault. Uh, and I had, you know, very, very, very low opinions of the liberal tradition uh, at this point. Uh, but my supervisor, who was G.A. Cohen's student, uh, but a liberal egalitarian, started to shift me on that. So part of it is just purely pedagogical. Uh, but the other more, I suppose, intellectual and political reason uh, is as I dove deeper into the liberal tradition and various left traditions, what I realized was in many respects, People on the left didn't necessarily want to do away with liberal principles. They just didn't think that they were really safe in liberal hands. And I would include certainly young Marx in that category. Right? If you were to ask anyone on the left, do you support multiculturalism? The way, for instance, many Canadian liberals like Charles Taylor or Will Kimmelka do. Uh, most people on the left would say, well, of course, we support a degree of pluralism, certainly a very high degree of multiculturalism. We certainly do not want ethno chauvinism or right wing nationalism. Uh, but none of these things are safe in liberal hands because the liberal state is incapable of genuinely respecting difference. Uh, if you were to ask them, you know, do you believe in freedom of expression or, you know, freedom of religion, uh, the way that, say, Marx certainly believed in free expression. I'm sure we'll get into that since you've been reading Igor's book. Once again, you know, many on the left would say, absolutely, right? But, you know, in a state that's dominated uh, by big capital uh, and, you know, the media consistently manufactures consent, to use the Chintomskin term. We don't really have freedom of expression. Certainly, we don't have a diverse set of media out there that are able to articulate progressive positions. So we really believe in freedom of expression in a way that liberals don't. And the list goes on and on and on. And 
once I realized that, I became a lot more interested in the overlaps between the liberal tradition and the left, and less fixated on criticizing what I took to be the differences. Uh, now, I do think that there are important differences, and we can get into that as time goes on. But this is where the germ of the idea for liberal socialism came out. Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, <clears throat> I was reading Harold Lasky's um, really interesting historical uh, book on the emergence of European liberalism. And mm -hmm. one of the things that he makes quite clear is that liberalism is to be understood as operating on what he calls a conflation between liberty and equality. Mm -hmm. And he says that the cornerstone of liberal, of, of the liberal social order, is, is premised on the necessity for the preservation of private property. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think this is the exact point at which we run a risk of either the notion of liberal socialism becoming an almost oxymoron or um, kind of facing the critique that Marx ultimately, and, and when I say Marx, I, I understand Marx as the highest achievement of socialist thought. So Definitely. that's kind of like, I, I consider Marx a socialist, I consider myself a socialist. I think that he presents the best challenge both to liberalism, but also to socialism, right? Because Marx, of course, is a major critic of socialism. Mm -hmm. So um, let us maybe start with this notion of liberal equality. And you've written mm -hmm. so much on equality. Um, how is, you know, liberal equality something like, what are its blind spots? What are its limitations? And for you, obviously, you want to retain the notion of liberal of liberal philosophy in some form. But can you really retain it? It's its conception of equality without so drastically reforming it. Like, how does that work for you? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and we might even want to break it up into parts because this is what so much of my work does focus on, right? Uh, but here, I think it actually is helpful to contrast liberal notions of equality to the political right, which, as you know, is something I also write a great deal about. So it's important to emphasize that notions of human equality are very, very new, right? Particularly political equality, but also the more robust forms of equality that many left liberals and socialists both argue for, right? Uh, as I point out in my book, The Political Right and Equality, if you go back to antiquity, uh, thinkers like Aristotle, for example, uh, what really comes to the fore in their thought is this notion that people are fundamentally unequal, right? Uh, they're born unequal, they become more unequal in society, and as time goes on, they become more unequal still, right? Uh, as their different aptitudes uh, express themselves. Uh, and, you know, you can read this in Aristotle's politics very clearly, right, where Aristotle, as he was once called, you know, the great organizer of common sense, certainly for the Athenian order, uh, he says, look, certain people just possess higher degrees or lesser degrees of what he calls deliberative reason, at least in the translation I read, uh, you know, the kind of upper aristocracy uh, of Athens um, or, you know, any other major Greek city, uh, they possess a high degree of deliberative reason. So, of course, they should be entitled to more political rights, you know, higher degrees of wealth and status. Uh, women uh, and, you know, certain kind of working class individuals, they possess some deliberative reason, not too much. Um, but, you know, they can be on a lower echelon uh, of the pyramid. And then there are some people who possess no deliberative reason whatsoever. Uh, and Aristotle infamously claimed these people should just be natural slaves. That's their job, right? And aligned with this was often a very teleological vision of how society operates. Uh, this is what Charles Taylor calls the notion of hierarchical complementarity. This idea that society is fundamentally a pyramid, you know, a hierarchical pyramid uh, with people at the top and people at the bottom. Everyone has a role to play and each rung of the pyramid needs one another. Uh, but it's by no means the case that the people at the bottom of the pyramid possess or should possess the same degree of dignity, the same degree of rights under the law as those at the top. Uh, and what you really see starting to change with the lib advent of the liberal tradition, and Marx himself acknowledged this, right, uh, was a profound shift in the way that people think about these things. Uh, and I think this comes to the fore more than anything else in the work of Thomas Hobbes, not himself a liberal, but a proto-liberal, uh, who would also characterize as one of the world's first great materialists, right? Uh, where Hobbes says, look, this Aristotelian idea that A, there's some kind of purpose that everyone fills in society, uh, or B, that people are fundamentally unequal is just nonsense, right? Uh, the world is just matter in motion. No one has any kind of intrinsic purpose to which they are set at all, right? We all determine our own purposes, right? In the same way that we create the social world around us. Uh, but also this idea that people are fundamentally unequal. Uh, yeah, maybe if you look at it from an unscientific standpoint, uh, and you kind of, kind of narcissistically or vaingloriously assume that, well, I'm a little more clever or a little stronger or a little younger than other people, uh, and that just makes me better and entitles me to more political power than others. Uh, but Hobbes' insistence is, look, seen naturalistically, 
uh, there's very little difference between human beings, right? Uh, even the cleverest person knows very, very little of the vast sum of knowledge that's out there. Uh, and, you know, seen again from an objective standpoint, their knowledge relative to the most ignorant person in their society is pretty proximate, right? Uh, and the same is true of physical strength, right? We're all destined to the same place, the grave. Uh, and, you know, maybe a couple of us will bench a few more, you know, uh, weights before we get there, but it's all winding up in the same place anyway, right? Uh, and this notion that people are in a state of nature equal and create society and its norms through their own will is fundamentally a liberal notion that emerges in the thinking of people like Hobbes and Locke. Uh, and I think that all socialists owe them a debt for first formulating these ideas from a theoretical standpoint, right? Now, I do think that Certainly the classical liberal tradition was very inadequate in terms of its understanding of equality. And I'll get into that in a few seconds. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to know if you had any follow-up questions to that. No, I think it's really helpful. In other words, um, the modern, the, the, the early modern introduction of notions of equality um, emerged from a lineage of a liberal tradition, which um, it constitutes a serious rupture with the, um, but I mean, it's interesting that you know you you make this this because this also becomes a debate where whereby um, you're always sort of looking for a mean or a metric by which to base your theory of equality off of, mm -hmm. and there has been a lively debate, say in the Marxist tradition, about whether reason can mm -hmm. function as an arbiter of equality. People like Adorno and Horkheimer would probably argue that it cannot, right, mm -hmm. or that there's something tyrannous about using reason. And even going back to Aristotle and things like this. So there's always this question. And there's, of course, these vulgar liberal responses to Marxism, which will say that Marxism reduces the question of equality to uh, these kind of ec economic categories of determination. <clears throat> so I do want to get Jordan Peterson thing that says, like, oh, Marxists just want equality of outcome, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I do want to get to um, how we might think of the 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 mean the means by which we are Im implementing a, a theory of equality and and we can also talk about Rawls but we, please why don't you continue your, your point and we can get back to some of those sure absolutely so this is actually a good jumping off point for my own critique of classical liberalism uh, or what's sometimes called possessive individualism um, by C.B. McPherson, uh, because there is no doubt that the theory of equality, certainly in terms of its social implications that one finds in many aspects of the classical liberal tradition, uh, is deeply unsatisfactory uh, and certainly should be to anyone who identifies as a socialist, right? Uh, and there's a reason why certainly Marxists and many early socialists identified classical liberalism with a defense of private property. You know, John Locke, you know, includes private property uh, and his trifecta of natural rights that people are guaranteed uh, even prior to entering society. Uh, and moving forward, you can even find somebody like Ludwig von Mises, right, uh, in his book, Liberalism, you know, what's in the title, uh, who says, you know, the essence of liberalism just is the defense of private property or, you know, private ownership of the means of production. Uh, all other, you know, demands of the liberal tradition follow from this. Uh, and in many ways, this view is deeply unsatisfactory because I think in some respects, it's actually worse than what came before, even though it's more egalitarian on the surface. Because at least within antiquity uh, or the medieval era, there was the sense of noblesse oblige that the aristocracy would sometimes pay to people at the bottom. Uh, usually based on the idea that, look, God ordered everyone to be in their place. Uh, of course, those at the bottom have to stay at the bottom. Uh, but nonetheless, this is divinely ordained. So it's not like the people at the bottom are responsible for where they wind up, right? It just happens to be that, you know, there are people in society who need to clean the sewers, right? God understands this or nature understands this. And that's what you do. Same as, you know, I'm a Lord and that's what I do. Well, you see, emerge with the classical liberal tradition, uh, particularly in Locke's thought, uh, which is very contradictory this way, uh, is this idea that actually, no, people raise themselves up by their own efforts. Uh, so we all start from a standpoint of equality, which I want to again stress is a really radical and important idea that we cannot abandon. But the problem is, if we are all regarded as starting from the same standpoint and elevating ourselves by our own efforts, then, of course, the people at the top get there through their own efforts. And the inverse of that is that the people who wind up at the bottom also wound up at the bottom because they just couldn't cut it, right? Uh, they were lazy. They were indolent. Uh, they were incapable. They lacked the same talents as those at the top. 
Uh, and so what you see emerge is an extremely harsh and cruel society of the sort that's really appropriate to the emergence of capitalism, where the new ruling class feels that it owes nothing to those who, came at the who are at the bottom, uh, or even thinks that if they're there at the bottom, it's because they're deficient in some way, shape, or form, right? Uh, and what's in many ways, I think, even more toxic is people at the bottom are often induced to internalize this sense of themselves through various kind of ideological and hegemonic methods, or methods right? Where they're told, look, uh, you know, you're just lazy, right? Or you can't cut it or you're not as good as everyone else. Uh, so, you know, be content, you know, where you are because that's what you deserve, right? Uh, and I think that that's an idea that has had a long shelf life and it's really become instantiated in a more radical form than ever before in our neoliberal epoch. And we really have to blame the classical liberal tradition for all the extraordinary amounts of resentment and toxicity uh, in our culture that have emerged as a result of many people in the working class and the ruling class internalizing these views. Yes, I mean, part of this is the tyranny of the market and the argument of socialists back to liberals, especially in a post-French revolutionary milieu, mm -hmm. that you liberals have a blind spot because mm -hmm. your metric for the determination of liberty um, and equality, because again, as, as Harold Lasky says, liberals make the mistake of conflating liberty with equality mm -hmm. because they rely on the market as the site of freedom. Um, that there's an idea, almost like, you, you know, an ideological operation, which is you're sort of disavowing the tyranny of the market and you must therefore presuppose that it has a kind of quasi magical force <laughs> to sort of settle and determine well, frankly, it's it's a kind of um, it's a kind of un ontology of naturalism, like the oh, market yes. becomes a natural thing. And so, you seem to be opposed to this presupposition. Very much so. And that's a, that's a philosophical debate that a lot of socialists are obviously also opposed to. But you're different because you're saying, "Well, I want to make this fight within liberalism." So, is your point kind of like? We need to tether with these liberals on their grounds, and we need to have these debates with them, right? Are you kind of saying that socialists haven't engaged liberals philosophically well enough? Is that one way to kind of look at what motivates your project here? I don't know if that's entirely true. I think there are actually a number of leftists who have engaged liberalism very successfully, right? Uh, I would add Domenico Lucerto uh, into that group. Uh, I mean, Domenico Lucerto's liberalism a counter history is famous for being a scathing critique of liberalism, rightly so, right? So in the classical liberalism. Uh, but it's also worth noting at the end of the book, he says, look, liberalism's achievements are so self-evident uh, and so sweeping uh, that there's no need for me to kind of list them out here at the end of the book. They're just, you should know them, right? Uh, or you can look at, um, Tony Smith's Beyond Liberal Egalitarianism. Uh, I wrote a review of his book for Liberal Currents, uh, which is a very good Marxist critique of liberal egalitarianism uh, that I think rightly points out that even a tradition that I have a lot of sympathy for has major blind spots that Marxism needs to fill in, particularly in terms of the critique and analysis of power, which frankly liberals have never been particularly adept at, right? So we can get into that later on in the discussion. Uh, but what I think is important to stress here uh, is that I would demarcate a critique of this possessive variant of liberalism from a degree of support for the kind of liberalism that I think is not just palatable, but necessary. Uh, and here I would argue that in fact, that's the dialectical move, right? Uh, a critique of liberalism isn't necessarily a rejection of liberalism, it's a sublation uh, or overcoming of the limitations of the classical liberal tradition, carrying on what is vital in the tradition and chucking the rest. Because I do think uh, that there is a kind of theological ideology that becomes attached to market society uh, after classical liberalism emerges, uh, which very much kind of replicates again the old Aristotelian mindset about the importance of sorting people into where they belong, uh, except con contorted uh, along different lines, uh, where you'll start to see people like, you know, Malthus or, you know, for that matter, Ayn Rand, uh, or somebody I mentioned before, Ludwig von Misa, not to mention a hundred million Republicans at this day who will say, look, you know, the invisible hand of the market is kind of like the hand of God, right? Uh, back in the old teleological world, uh, where, you know, people rise and fall based on their efforts and the market will sort everybody where they belong in society. And this really is a kind of magical thinking, right? Uh, in fact, you know, it's almost, you know, a Santa Claus like thinking where we imagine, well, you know, everybody in society needs to be in their proper place uh, because if they're not, there's something extremely distorting about that. Uh, and somehow the market is the best mechanism for achieving that. Um, and if it's not, then, yeah, you know, we've also know that reactionaries are willing to 
break from the market where they feel that the undeserving are getting too much of a fair, uh, like a shake uh, in any given society. But what I think happens starting in the 18th century in the writings of Thomas Paine and Mary Wollstonecraft is a shift in liberal thinking. So they're who I really open my book with, uh, particularly Thomas Paine, uh, where Paine, many people know him as one of the foundational figures of the American Revolution, rightly so. Uh, in fact, any leftist could probably enjoy his pamphlet, Common Sense, because he's just a scathing critic uh, of the aristocracy. But very few people uh, go on to engage uh, the second half of the rights of man uh, or his pamphlet, Agrarian Justice, where for the first time I argue in the liberal tradition, he argues that actually private property is not a consequence of people laboring and through their own efforts acquiring wealth. That is part of it, right? Uh, but he also says, look, private property is eminently a kind of social phenomena and people owe their private property to the existence of society, which means that those who have private property owe society and other generations and the poor a debt, right, that they have to pay off. Uh, and Payne builds upon this argument uh, to make one of the most comprehensive early cases for the implementation of something like a welfare state, right? Um, quite remarkable. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, also very, very vigorous liberal, uh, advocate of the French Revolution, uh, wrote a sparkling critique of Edmund Burke that everyone should also read because I really enjoy it. Uh, but she also says, look, the root of all social problems right now uh, are inequities in private property, right? Because inequities in private property have a distorting effect on people's mindset. Uh, again, it leads the rich to assume that, look, I got here because through some magical process, I was ordained to be here. Uh, and the poor are also where they are because through some magical process, that's where they're ordained to be. Uh, and she says that we will never have a society that is genuinely virtuous, uh, but also committed to liberty and equality and solidarity until inequities in private property are largely ameliorated, right, uh, in many respects. Now, she died at, um, in her mid-30s, so she didn't really have a lot of time to unspool what this would connote, you know, systematically. Yeah. Uh, and had she lived, you know, who knows what she would have contributed. Uh, but the germ of the idea of liberal socialism, I argue, uh, was latent in the writings of people like Paine and Wollstonecraft, and then really matures to a certain extent, I should say, in the writing of John Stuart Mill. So how, so this is great. So obviously we know that historically, um, I'm thinking like, for example, um, one reading of the evolution in the 19th century <laughs> of how the bourgeois class kind of preserved capitalism. Because you see, one of the ways of counter history reading of capitalist history, liberal history, et cetera, is that um, Marx's proposition that history is driven by mm -hmm. class struggle. Of course, mm -hmm. Marx says that he wasn't the first one to invent this idea. No. Um, there have been prior thinkers in classical political economy and so on that had that had thought of this um but you see it's always a question of maintaining a social order and maintaining the hierarchies of that social order and in in the capitalist one it is um through the tyranny of the market and private property and so charity is invented right mm -hmm. and, and and but that it's it really it really comes to the fore really in like the 1830s up through the 1840s and then like in the united states it becomes enacted in a big way but why well, it's a device to uh, prevent the possibility of revolution from below, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the ruling class is in a dialectic with subordinated classes, right? And that's how the Marxist vision of history kind of unfolds, right? It's that, it's that story. Mm -hmm. And so I, feel, I wonder, like, <clears throat> is liberal socialism committed to the Marxist proposition or the Marxist goal, let's say? of what Marx calls class abolition or mm -hmm. class emancipation? Or is the liberal socialist vision more in line with a kind of um, charity model or a kind of um, preservation mm -hmm. of existing forms of capitalism? But, and if so, what gives you confidence that liberal mm -hmm. socialists would be able to stabilize the social order and not function as basic like ruling class arbiters of crisis which i think like even today like mm -hmm. we have a weird situation in which capitalist power is impersonal domination right mm -hmm. and so the squad becomes empowered through dsa right and they have all of these socialist values but they hit the inertia of a system that prevents those values from being mm -hmm. realized right 
And so that tells you something about the power of the impersonal power of domination of capitalist mm -hmm. social relations, right? Um, that, that really just sort of obliterates all of your ideals, right? It, 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 it's this thing that makes people into cynics and pessimists, well, right? That's for sure. <laughs> and of course, you could be like Nietzsche and be like, yes, we must dig into this pessimism, right? <laughs> um, but I actually, I actually don't believe that. Um, but anyways, so let's go back to the question just to make it straight. Is this for, is, okay, let's just be, uh, is this a class emancipation prognosis or program that you are kind of advocating? Let's start there. Uh, I'll break your question into two. Uh, the first of the question, is it about class emancipation? Uh, and I would argue emphatically, yes, right? What distinguishes a liberal socialism or liberal socialists uh, from say, reformists, right, uh, is this idea that we need to go beyond uh, the horizons of simply impl like implementing various welfare measures, right, uh, and really think about extending liberal principles of liberty and equality for all to the economy. Uh, and I should add also other social fears uh, like the family, since many liberal socialists were deeply committed to feminist emancipation, which is a virtue of the tradition, I would argue, right. Uh, now, in terms of your second question, this is why I think actually liberal socialism has been extremely deficient throughout its entire history. Uh, now, I know I'm known, you know, to the extent that I am known uh, as a defender of liberal socialism, and I'm proud to adopt that label. Uh, but I want to stress that my book, especially the chapter that I'm writing right now, which is about Marx, is by no means uh, a hagiography of the tradition. You know, this idea that everything in it was perfect and we should just go back to liberal socialism, whether a la Mill or a la Rawls uh, or a la Chantal Mouffe. Uh, liberal socialism never got implemented for a lot of reasons, right? Uh, many of these are materialist, so I don't want to play into the narcissism of the intellectuals by saying that, you know, if we just had a different set of ideas in the liberal socialist tradition, things would have worked out differently. Uh, but I think it, if you look at the history of liberal socialism with, you know, clear eyes, it's very clear that these people do not have a very rigorous understanding of the operations of power, particularly economic power and domination, to complement their ideological framework, right, uh, or their ideational framework. And that's a serious deficiency. Uh, so I often kind of summarize my own politics uh, plagiarizing Gramsci uh, as, you know, we need Rawlsian optimism of the will uh, and Marx's pessimism on the intellect. Uh, so liberal socialism has very often had Rawlsian optimism of the will, and I think that that's a positive thing, but it needs a lot more Marx's pessimism of the intellect, uh, which is why, again, I find people like Lucerto or uh, Soren Mao, uh, particularly his new Mute Compulsion book, very, very helpful uh, in trying to think through new ways uh, of conceiving liberal socialism that still keep the normative core of the project intact, but nonetheless aren't dupes uh, about power. Uh, and this is one of the things that, again, think um, is a problem of conciliation uh, that some others have tried to work out over time. People like Irving Howe in his essay, uh, Liberalism and Socialism, Articles of Conciliation. But there's, boy, oh, boy, so much more work to be done. Yeah, and I do want to I do want to get your thoughts on the history uh, during the Second International of Edward Bernstein and mm -hmm. the uh, upon the death of Engels, the reformist movement within the SPD in Germany, the largest socialist presence in Europe, mm -hmm. and the fact that at that moment in time, by say the 1890s, liberal socialism was at the crescendo, right? in the kind of grand symphony since the French Revolution of it finally being in a place to be realized in the parliamentary system. Here we are. And I wanna get your thoughts on that historical experience. Most Marxists, I think especially after what happened in Russia and Bolshevism, will say, look, uh, Bernstein was less successful than Lenin and Trotsky and mm -hmm. so on in the grand sweep of the history of Marxism and socialism. Because obviously most people think that Stalin was an aberration and a problem and a kind of Bonapartist degeneration. Uh, well, 1917 was an incredible infusion of egalitarian possibility for women, for the ab abolishment of the peasantry, and, and then it spilled over into China and so on. Whereas with Bernstein, it seems, Matt, and I want your thoughts on this, harder to make the case, right, that the reformist liberal socialists that emerged there in the kind of passing of the torch from Engels after, 
it seems harder to make the case that they were in the long sweep of history um, advocates to your claim or advocates to your side. But mm -hmm. I feel like you want to make the claim that actually this was uh, that they were and that we can learn from them. So perhaps you might make the case for Edward Bernstein and do you, first of all, do you consider him a liberal socialist? I do. Uh, actually, I would argue that in many senses, uh, he's canonical liberal socialist. Uh, and I'm happy to see that there's actually been some academic movement on that front. Uh, so Elizabeth Anderson actually has a wonderful uh, segment on Bernstein uh, in her latest book, Critical of Neoliberalism, uh, where she points out that what she calls a social democratic or democratic socialist tradition has never been sufficiently canonized, uh, at least for an analytic audience. I would argue that if you were to go to Europe, uh, there certainly is plenty of understanding of this canon, right? Uh, and so she's do, making an effort to kind of reintegrate Bernstein uh, and his influence into the canon. Oh, sorry. Just got a phone call. I'll call it back later. Uh, so I would argue that, you know, Bernstein was not successful, right? There's no denying that. Uh, but Willie Brandt was, right? Uh, and I'd argue that Willie Brandt implemented one of the most successful variants of liberal socialism uh, that we've seen thus far, in particular through really going to town for the co-determination model uh, that not wasn't necessarily his brain style, but certainly was um, his favorite child uh, in you know the West German context. In terms of why Bernsteinian um, liberal socialism failed, I would just put forward that you know every version of socialism ultimately failed in Germany. So my feeling is that Everyone uh, deserves a lot of blame for that, right? Uh, the reality is that the SPD um, collaborated in many senses with the reactionary elements within German society to try to enact a transition to a parliamentary republic. Whatever you think about that aspiration, it went about that tactically and strategically in a lot of the long, wrong ways. Uh, Bernstein, who supported the USPD, ended up floundering and not really accomplishing all that much. Uh, and, you know, the Communist Party and the Bolsheviks, um, you know, tried to establish a kind of council revolution. You can argue that they were betrayed by, you know, um, the SPD and the various reactionary elements in German society. But, you know, success is measured by success. Uh, and they failed, right? There's no doubt about that. Uh, and it's important to note that Flash forward to 1933, the SPD and the KPD between them uh, had enough votes to block Nazi takeover, right? Uh, or at least make it very, very hard for Hitler to seize the kinds of power that he did. And very little was actually accomplished by either party, right? Many of its major leaders, Fred, uh, many of them also wound up in concentration camps, which, you know, obviously I have enormous sympathy for, right? Uh, Willie Brandt, you know, ended up fleeing uh, and spent a lot of time there. Uh, but it, when it comes to the lessons uh, of what that we can draw from this experience, uh, I think it's that the contingencies of history always operate in a way that overwhelm our ideological conceits. Uh, because I don't think that anybody really acquitted themselves particularly well, regardless of where on the left spectrum they happen to fall during that time period. Um, but in terms of the longer scope of history, uh, I do think that democratic centralism of the sort practiced by Lenin or Stalin, as it was once called, uh, has proven itself to be disastrous in a way that Bernsteinian liberal socialism, a la somebody like Willy Brandt, hasn't, which is why I'm willing to plant my flag there. So philosophically, do you then associate your, your practice with the same kind of neo-Kantian pragmatism? Of, mm -hmm. of a Bernstein, is that fair to say? Um, because I do think that that's an important mm, touchstone point, which is a big, obviously, contrast from how the Bolsheviks would orientate or how a thinker like Lukács, or uh, I don't want to use the word orthodox Marxist, mm -hmm. um, but maybe we could. Um, I read that strain, which I obviously mm -hmm. am in more solidarity with, and that that's a that's a difference, which is, is fine. I'm, it's and not like I'm hostile to that, but I do think it might be interesting to see if you um, orientate yourself also mm -hmm. in that neo-Kantian way. And I mean, that would make sense, right? Because mm -hmm. I think Rawls does in his own way as well and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So perhaps we could sit, talk about your philosophical foundation there. Is it more pragmatist? Is it neo-Kantian? How do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I want to stress that my own book is a genealogical history uh, of liberal socialism, right? Uh, a kind of re reconstructs, uh, or to use the McPhersonian term, retrieves uh, different parts of the tradition. Uh, and I, for the most part, tend to be agnostic, except near the end uh, about my own views. Uh, but, you know, in terms of what I believe, I tend to label myself a kind of Rawlsian Marxist, uh, or Rawlsian Marxist, as it's called. Uh, and one of the reasons why this makes sense to me uh, is 
Rawls was most certainly influenced by Kant. There's no doubt about that, right? Particularly his early work, uh, like the first edition of Theory of Justice, where he talks about the Kantian interpretation of justice's fairness. Uh, and I have quite a bit of sympathy for Kant and Kantianism. Uh, and I would add any Marxist should, right? Since, of course, there's a genealogical link uh, between Marx and Kant uh, that's filtered through Hegel, right? And there's a lot of remarkable scholarly work done about uh, the links between these different figures uh, and how their thought led to one another. Uh, but Rawls was not ever uh, exclusively a Kantian, right, and his orientation. Uh, he was always very transparent about his debt to Hegel and especially Marx, right? Uh, in particular, he points out that what was in many ways his core theoretical shift, moving the focus of liberalism from the atomistic individual and their rights uh, to the basic structure, society, right? Uh, as the subject of liberal just justice, was inspired, as he put it, by Hegel and Marx uh, and their realization that structural factors matter in determining how outcomes uh, play themselves out for many people in any given society, right? Uh, and Rawls characterized Marx as not just a genius, but a heroic figure, right, uh, in his lectures on Marx in the history of political philosophy, uh, precisely for intuiting, uh, or sorry, not even intuiting, systematizing uh, this insight uh, that we have to look at the basic structure of society if we're going to understand how individuals uh, lead their lives, the kind of ideas that they happen to have, uh, and why they wind up where they do uh, under many different circumstances. Now, I don't think that Rawls's vision is complete because, again, while I'm very normatively attracted to this kind of Hegelian Marxist Kantian uh, ideal, let's just call it that. Uh, again, it's deeply deficient in terms of its understanding of the various forms of power and domination that are operative in society. Uh, and there I think he would have benefited from spending a lot more time reading Capital uh, and various socialist works. Uh, but you know, the inverse of that is I think that if you read Marx, almost everybody complains about the fact that it's not really clear what kind of society is meant to replace uh, bourgeois capitalist society, because Marx just wasn't interested in, you know, developing recipe books or recipes for the cookshops of the future, right? Uh, that wasn't his project. Uh, and here's where I think somebody like Rawls can really complement uh, Marx's insight in various deep ways. Uh, although if you were to ask me, how do you integrate these two figures together successfully in a way that is theoretically and ideologically satisfying? Uh, that's something that I don't have a good answer to, although I plan on writing a book on that in the future. So, you know, stay tuned, maybe in uh, five, 10 years. Yeah, it's a big, it's obviously a huge, huge question. And, and there is a lineage of Kantian Marxists um, that I've talked about on, on my show a lot. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of sympathy for them. Lucien Goldman and Kojin Karatani are two that come to mind. There's many others. Mm -hmm. um, Hegel himself obviously um, formulates his conception of the um, system of ethics um, off of Kant's notions of the kingdom of ends, right? And, and the notion of the Kantian categorical imperative is, is an interesting one, right? Because for a liberal, if they have this blind spot of thinking freedom qua the market, well, then they kind of force this naive idea. And this is where, where Kant becomes a little devil. Where like, oh yeah, we live in the world where the, we can treat each other according to the Kantian categorical imperative. But, but the problem with that is that Marx comes along shortly after Kant, and he recognizes that the social order of capitalism is no longer mercantilist as it was under Kant's mm -hmm. period. So Karatani makes the point, which is brilliant, which is that Kant had no theory of fetishism. <laughs> In other words, Kant, Kant didn't know how to, uh, the biggest blind spot with Kantianism, and I think that is still a blind spot with Kantianism, is the reduction of social relations of persons to things is an impersonal process generated by forms of capital domination, okay? Mm -hmm. If you ha don't have an account of that, your Kantianism is going to be quite limited, right? And so, now you mentioned Rawls, and I think that Rawls is, is a fascinating figure. I think you should also throw in the, the, um, the debt that he has to perhaps the utilitarian tradition as yes. well mm -hmm. uh, in that. Uh, which which introduces a whole Epicurean dimension, and, and we can talk about that. Rawls is, is multifaceted, contradictory. Like, I, I wrote in my book on the family a section on Rawls where I show that um, even though Rawls has a critique of meritocracy, mm -hmm. when, when Rawls also um, puts forward this notion of, of the asset-owning society, 
as uh, uh, in, in such a way that doesn't pose a contradiction to his core theory of justice. That to me represents a blind spot of Rawls because just let us look at how third way Democrats and like the Blairite in, in the UK and others promoted in the 1990s, the Rawlsian asset owning mm -hmm. economy. And now look at how it's, look at look at the social effects of it. It's, it's led to uh, a lot of uh, animus, uh, agonism and, and conflict. And there's something problematic about that. Mm -hmm. it takes us back to property. So let us introduce Rawls, um, why you like him, why he's defensible for socialists, and how you face some of these contradictions, which is which is when you have an asset thing, this is what goes to meritocracy, um, you, you then force a system of meritocracy onto the people. You can't really get around that. So then how do you then uh, square that or address that, right? So bring up Rawls and how you think of him and how he's salvageable and so on. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to cheat a little bit and talk a bit about the Kant question first because I'm writing my chapter on Marx right now and I'm very invested in this. Uh, and I would like to argue that the core deficiency in Kant is the one that Lukács detected, uh, which is that Kant obviously is a brilliant figure uh, in understanding the importance of appearances, right? Because unlike so many other, you know, Cartesians, for example, uh, he understands appearance dialectically, right? He recognizes that we can't just, you know, dismiss appearance because it's not reality. We need to understand our relationship to it systematically. But he never appreciates the systematic and social ways that this can have extraordinary implications in a way that I think that Marx does, right? Because what Marx, drawing upon Hegel, really understands uh, is that the social world is created, right? Uh, and it consists of a huge array uh, of created appearances, right? Uh, and these things can be extraordinarily distortive of our behavior if we reify them and naturalize them, you know, treat them as things to which we are subject rather than things to which we, which we create, right? Uh, and capital is extraordinarily effective at creating a world of appearances and fictions uh, that nonetheless operate as what he calls real abstractions, right? That are determinative of our social behavior uh, and even subordinate us, although that they are our creation. Right. Uh, and this is, I think, the real methodological point of difference uh, between Marx and, say, the neo-Kantian tradition. Right. It's the understanding of the social implications uh, of our relationship to appearance, uh, which is one of the reasons I think that Marx's epistemology, or if you want to call it, uh, you know, phenomenology, I'd be comfortable with that as well, uh, is a profound reservoir of insight uh, that is very much not yet to be tapped, right? Uh, and I'm planning on writing more about this future. Uh, but in terms of its implication for Rawls uh, or anyone you're, in that- You're really, the reference, the reference to Lukács is mostly destruction of reason that you just articulated yes, there. That's right. Uh, yeah. no, I'm a huge fan of that book. <laughs> you know, no, no, no surprise, right? Since, uh, you know, it's basically a big condemnation uh, of the political right precisely because of its enamorment with appearance, right? Uh, and the way that it naturalizes or sublimates appearance. Uh, but long story short, I think that this is again, one of the deficiencies uh, in the liberal tradition, including within liberal socialism, right? Because if you do not understand how it is that the reified forms of appearance that we create in turn subordinate us, then you are never going to have a sufficiently rich understanding of power, particularly of the power of capital, right? And this is, I think, again, why Tony Smith's critique of liberal egalitarianism has real bite to it, right? Because it's wrong, I think, to criticize liberal egalitarians for not having an understanding of, say, the social situatedness uh, of individuals, right? Uh, very clearly, if you read Rawls or Sen or Nussbaum, they do, right? Uh, they're very influenced by Marx and Aristotle on that point. Uh, but this lack of an understanding of the mute compulsion that power, uh, sorry, that capital can exercise on for us, even though it is our creation, uh, is a very, very big flaw uh, in the tradition. Now, in terms of what socialists can learn from Rawls, uh, this is, again, where I think his normative theory becomes very attractive uh, and in many ways very coincided with Marx's own implicit normative theory, right? Because I think that Rawls, sorry, uh, Marx, in his heart of hearts, uh, even though he didn't want to write, you know, recipe books for the cookshops of the future, uh, was kind of a left Aristotelian or left Hegelian. Uh, he was committed to this idea that human freedom and equality was obviously extraordinarily important, uh, but it could only be achieved uh, in a social context where the free development of each was a condition for the free development of all. Uh, because as long as we lived in a society where we were divided into atomistic individuals, each pursuing our own hedonic pleasure by capital, uh, we would never be able to flourish um, successfully. Right? And he makes this point very clear, I would say, by the time you get to uh, Capital Volume 3, uh, where 
his in his richest understanding of what a socialist future would look like, uh, he says, "Look, you know, um, socialism will be defined by the fact that for the first time, the f development of human powers will become an end in itself, and the mutual development of our powers will become an end in itself, rather than." exercising our limited powers for the sake of capital, for the sake of the kinds of appearances and social systems that we create, right? Uh, it's a profound insight, but it's also one that Rawls, I would argue, shares, right? Uh, Rawls is sometimes criticized very, very crudely by many Marxists uh, as a proponent of atomistic individualism or hedonism. Uh, now, he certainly thinks that human beings are self-interested, uh, but he never denied, first off, uh, that human beings want to develop their powers uh, because this is something that's extremely gratifying for them, uh, and also that it requires very, very, very egalitarian social settings uh, so that we can do that in a way that is mutually self-reinforcing and solidaristic. Uh, and this becomes very clear at the end of, the of Theory of Justice, even the first edition, where he talks, for instance, about the Aristotelian principle uh, and goes into great detail about what this would entail. Uh, but by the time you get to justice and fairness, it becomes even more clear, where he says, look, uh, even welfareism could not adequately fulfill the requirements of justice uh, because it's still too isolating uh, and it doesn't appreciate the relational way that human beings interact with one another and the way differential relations of power can be extremely alienating uh, and extremely subordinating. So only something like liberal socialism uh, or property owning democracy can actually instantiate liberal justice. Uh, and I think it's a very rich thought that Marxists could draw a great deal from uh, were they to engage with it in good faith. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking here of the French Marxist Daniel Ben Said and his critique of Rawls. And he's like, look, Rawls flirts with Marx, but he misses the point that for Marx, capital is theft. Mm -hmm. And that for Marx, um, labor theory of value and the theory of surplus generation uh, itself is, is this um, embedded uh, uh, procedure, which uh, pro a property owning democracy um, will always um will always uh, push back like these the, it, 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 in a sense Rawls is relying on a, a generative system that will inevitably produce <clears throat> contradictions for which uh the whole edifice of his system cannot adequately contend with and moreover uh and I think this is opens up slightly new domain that I want to talk to you about there's not uh a uh, uh, sense that it, there, there needs to be a revolutionary um, yep. intervention into the system of capital, right? Um, whereas I think that this might be uh, in a, a, where liberal socialists part ways with a lot of more traditional Marxist orientations that would insist on maintaining, and obviously we think here of the history of how this played out in party formations in the parliamentary system where you have revolutionary socialists and democratic socialists. I'm not I'm not really convinced of this dichotomy today. Sure, I don't sure. I don't think that's a fair dichotomy. But um how can property owning let's go back to Rawls. How can Rawls's commitment to property ownership like I always make this beautiful historical point that FDR's new deal was the <laughs> single largest expansion of private property in human history. Of course after Bernie Sanders we're told that FDR was a socialist. <laughs> Even though he wasn't, he wasn't exactly. Maybe he was a liberal socialist. Uh, that's an interesting point. But you see, my question is: um, Can Rawls account for the contradictions of capital and property? And what? So make that case if you can, or can he not? And maybe Rawls needs to be supplemented somehow, because mm -hmm. you you seem to be saying that Rawls actually was a great reader of Marx, and he's in. He, you know, you read Rawls and it's already an adequate uh, incorporation of Marxist insights. Mm -hmm. you, that seems to be your position. Mm -hmm. um, or do you think that actually Rawls really, really didn't fully see the tyranny of capital and, and surplus value and, and how it's important to uh, transcend it? So, no, I would say that. I don't, I would say Sure. Yeah. I would say that Rawls isn't a great reader of Marx. I think that he is an appreciative reader of Marx. Uh, and like I said, I think there's a deep affinity between their normative outlooks. Uh, and I think that the one core insight that he takes from Marx uh, is this idea that the basic structure uh, needs to be the subject of liberal justice, which he explicitly says is a point that he 
drew inspiration from Hegel uh, and Marx for, right? Uh, but in terms of Marx's analysis, uh, sorry, Rawls's analysis of capital, obviously it's profoundly deficient. Uh, and I'm not the only one who said this. Uh, Will Edmondson made this point very brilliantly in his book, uh, John Rawls, Reticent Socialist, uh, where he points out that in his defense of property owning democracy, uh, in many respects, Rawls regresses to Georgism, right? This idea that, or Jeffersonianism, right? Uh, this idea that, well, we'll have a collection of small stakeholders, uh, each of whom will own, you know, their little business or their little farmstead or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and since everybody has, you know, a little bit of property, uh, you know, that is you know, distributed in a relatively egalitarian way, uh, things will, you know, carry on uh, with less alienation than before uh, and on more egalitarian basis than before. Uh, and I think that this is a naive vision, right? Um, mm. Particularly mm. in a globalized context. Uh, not only that, I think that it underestimates what Marx really appreciated, uh, which is the fact that concentrations of capital uh, really do enable us to fulfill human needs in a way that widely distributed property wasn't capable of, right, uh, during the medieval or the feudal era. Uh, now, Marx was also extremely prop uh, like extremely sensitive to the fact that there was a serious price to be paid for this. Uh, but Edmondson's point, as this pertains to Rawls, is that this is why he should have doubled down on his second uh, main candidate uh, for implementing justice as fairness, which was liberal socialism rather than property owning democracy, right? Uh, which mm -hmm. a lot more has been written about. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to this view, right? I think that a proper instantiation of Rawlsian justice would require us to transition to liberal socialism rather than property owning democracy, because I think property owning democracy is subject to all the problems with distributism, Georgism, uh, or Jeffersonianism that Marxists have pointed out for a very, very long time, right? So there's no need for us to get into this. On the more technical point, though, you make about exploitation uh, and the labor theory of value, here I am with Rawls, uh, and I should also add with a variety of other liberals. Uh, so I personally don't think that Marx held to any kind of crude idea that the workers are entitled to ownership of what it is that they produce because they have mix their labor uh, with the matter that they are working on. Uh, in fact, I think if you read Capital Volume 1 closely, uh, he points out that this is basically a Lockean idea that was picked up by the Ricardian socialists. Uh, and, you know, it has a certain amount of appeal, uh, but it's not dialectical enough. It's hugely problematic and it's hugely normative. Uh, and it's not what he's getting at at all with his scientific understanding of exploitation, right? However, there is no doubt that there is a kind of vulgar Marxist theoretical position uh, that is always agitated for socialism on the basis that the ruling class is exploitative precisely because it's stealing uh, from the workers what it is that they produce, right? Uh, now, I don't deny the rhetorical power of this, right? Uh, in fact, you know, in some of my popular articles, I'll sometimes gesture to that myself. Uh, and I think it's very problematic that socialists haven't found a kind of rhetorical standpoint to critique capital that is as appealing to the masses uh, as this one. But philosophically, I just think it's a bogus idea for a lot of different Rawlsian reasons, right? Uh, well, because well, sorry, one, one quick clarification. Uh, the sure. argument it would be vulgar if the causality was on the ruling class in some conscious intentions, but that's not the argument that uh, I think Marx makes. Rather, no, it's, it's um, that is uh, fetishized. Actually, the ruling class isn't the ruling class still functions on bourgeois rights of equality. So that 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 actual uh, relation of theft um, occurs through exchange value and occurs in this impersonal way, but it still is nonetheless a relation of theft. And of course, from the standpoint of class consciousness, that is a quite radicalizing knowledge of Marxism to inculcate into the proletariat for revolutionary ends. You can interpret that in different ways. I think it would be vulgar to personalize that. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Um, but it is still nonetheless theft at a systemic level. And I do think Marx submits to that. And if you do submit to that, that then has certain implications, I think, uh, that may or may not trip up the whole liberal socialist project. Um, because you didn't fully define liberal socialism in distinction to Rawls's property owning. I'm sure you probably do in the book. Um, and I'm sure that some, you know, socialist critics of Rawls maybe have shown us what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps you might uh, articulate a bit more of what that would look like. Um, is that like the nationalization of certain industries, for example? Mm -hmm. 
et cetera? Sure, uh, that's a great question. Um, do you mind if I say that uh, for our next round of conversation? Because I actually want to address the the technical point on this, um, sure. both on Marx and Rawls, because I think it's so important, right? Uh, you know, first off, you know, um, I agree with you, right? That I don't think that Marx is ever saying that it's the capitalists that are stealing from the workers. Uh, every now and then, he'll gesture rhetorically in that direction because you know Marx was a great journalist and he understood the power of personalizing things this way. But as he points out in the preface to Capital, where he says, you know. The capitalists will often come across uh, as very, very poorly uh, in my text, but I want to make it very clear that when I refer to them, I am not referring to specific individuals. Uh, I'm referring to capitalists as a kind of structural category. That's the translation that I've usually seen, right? Uh, or the role that they are playing within the social totality, right? Uh, and in many ways, you know, he points out that with the transition to a higher form of society, uh, the forms of alienation and subordination to which capitalists themselves are, sub are subordinate, uh, will also be overcome to their benefit, right? So you could maybe make an instrumental case uh, for capitalists wanting socialism uh, from this kind of Marxist standpoint. Uh, but, you know, I think that, you know, David Harvey unpacks this extremely successfully with his discussion of the Ricardian socialists uh, in um, his um, Guide to Reading Capital and his Guide to the Grundries, where he points out that Marx was aware of Locke's arguments for a labor theory of entitlement and also aware of how the Ricardian socialists were operationalizing this quite successfully to say, look, if bourgeois society really holds to this idea that mixing your labor with the matter of the world entitles you to ownership, uh, well, then, you know, there's a serious problem with capitalism because the people who labor and invest their labor with the matter of the world uh, have that being expropriated by capital. Uh, on the other hand, right, there are other notions within bourgeois thought uh, that centralize the importance of the legal ownership of private ownership of the means of production uh, and the justice of the wage relations, which is also what, you know, Locke argues for in the Second Treatise of Government, less well known uh, than his labor theory of entitlement, uh, where he says, look, once all the land is used up and people are no longer able to create new property entitlements through mixing their labor with the matter of the earth, uh, then certain people are just going to have to become wage laborers and they're going to have to sell their labor as a commodity on the market uh, by mixing their labor with matter, uh, but now for someone else's sake. And that's entirely legitimate because, you know, freedom of contract. And Harvey says that, you know, this is where you see a contradiction within bourgeois ideology uh, with the Ricardian socialists arguing for the entitlement of workers to what it is that they produce. Uh, the bourgeois class arguing, of course, that, you know, we have a legal entitlement to private ownership of the means of production and to establish a system of wage labor. Uh, and of course, between right and right, force decides. So the capitalists are going to tend to win this, right? Uh, so, you know, Marx's point is that we can't buy into Ricardian socialism because even if this has a kind of moral force, well, the bourgeoisie has plenty of other moral arguments that they can raise against this, right? Uh, and we all know, you know, there are similar debates going on between certain kinds of Ricardian or neo-Ricardian socialism today and say the libertarian movement that also emphasizes the importance of freedom of contract, right? So I don't want to get dive too much into the minutia of all that, but like everything else that Marx does, right? Uh, Marx was, you know, a great genius. He's always aware of these kinds of problems. And if you think that he wasn't, you just have to dive deeper into the work and you'll realize that he was usually very cognizant of these problems in a way that was usually deeper uh, than what you yourself are capable of, right? Uh, in terms, though, of the vulgar Marxist argument or the neo-Ricardian or Ricardian socialist argument that the biggest problem with capital, though, is a kind of theft. Uh, again, this is just where, as a Rawlsian from a normative standpoint, I just am not really convinced by a lot of those arguments, right? Uh, and the reason I'm not convinced by a lot of those arguments is just, for me, the way that we should understand the distribution of resources in society, uh, or for that matter, ownership of the means of production, isn't based on who is entitled to them, uh, but what distribution uh, wouldn't just be fair, but be conducive to the benefit of the least well off, right? Uh, and this is, again, a normative point that Rawls makes with great force in the course of theory of justice, uh, but it's predicated on his argument that ultimately the reason why some people wind up with more and some people wind up with less, uh, whether it's a result of their work or whether it's a result of their efforts, uh, it's morally arbitrary. Uh, for a variety of different reasons that we don't have to get into because they're highly technical, right? But I've always been convinced by this. Uh, and this applies as well, I should say, to what's sometimes called the workmanship ideal that you will see socialists and libertarians occasionally lean on. This idea that if you, again, mix your labor with the matter of the world, uh, you are entitled to what it is that you produce. Uh, well, Rawls would say, look, the capacity to labor is in many ways something that is morally arbitrary. Uh, because some people have more of a capacity to labor than others for reasons that are not within their control. Uh, so we shouldn't put the kind of weight on it uh, that so many people left and right have. 
Uh, and I'm very sympathetic to that argument. You know, we can continue to go down this route if you want. Uh, but I think it'd be better if we just transition to talking a bit about uh, liberal socialism, unless you really want to get into the minutia of this. No, no, no. No, it's good. I mean, I guess, I mean, Igor's book on um, Marx's critique of liberalism was, was eye-opening. Because oh, yeah, sorry. What, he, what he tries to demonstrate is that, yes, Marx has a critique of distrib a distribution-based form of of, of justice and of a future communist society. However, mm -hmm. when we look at Marx's actual texts, what we find is that the transition upon the workers seizure of power of the state and so on would have to rely upon at least a kind of intervallic period of a form of distribution that would elevate even um, bourgeois forms of legality and of rights of different forms um, to transition that. But ultimately, uh, I think it is the case that uh, Marx does not want society to remain within a distributive form of justice. And this is actually one of the interesting critiques that the Kantian Marxist Kojin Karatani gives against mm -hmm. Rawls, which he says is that the tyranny of capital will always reproduce itself in a distributive form mm -hmm. of a welfare-based uh, exchange relation and that Marx understood this and wanted to abolish forms of distribution ultimately, whatever his strategy may be, but that's not where we want it to end. Now, to return to what liberal socialism would propose, talk about that and talk about how we deal with distribution. Because what it sounds like is really that, yeah, liberal socialism is kind of committed to fair, achievement of a distributed of a distribution mm -hmm. you guess that means that you kind of keep does the capitalist class is it is it eradicated um mm -hmm. is wage labor eradicated in liberal socialism um maybe my, that might be some provocations for you of course yeah and these are great questions um and like i said I don't have firm answers uh, on all of the more practical ones uh that you raised since i'm still kind of mining um the theoretical basis of the tradition, right? So uh, there are four things that I want to say about the theory of liberal socialism before I get into a brief discussion of its practical instantiations. Uh, first off, on the revolutionary question, uh, I think it's important to stress that many liberal socialists were revolutionaries, right? Uh, or certainly weren't pacifistic, right? Uh, this goes all the way back to Thomas Paine, right? Who I mentioned as a formative influence on the tradition. Uh, Thomas Paine was in many ways the intellectual or certainly rhetorical godfather uh, of not one but two revolutionary movements in Europe, the American Revolution, or sorry, in uh, the Western world, uh, the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Uh, and he did so on, you know, the basis that uh, freedom for all, equality for all, and solidarity for all uh, are important things that we need to achieve, but we can't achieve them uh, so long as the structures of power characteristic of the Ancien Regime uh, are in place. Uh, and John Stuart Mill, you know, also was supportive uh, of various revolutionary movements. Uh, he was very, very, very much a fan of the French Revolution. Uh, he supported the transition to the Second Republic when it occurred, uh, even calling it, you know, a brilliant day uh, for the world, right? Uh, and, you know, just go back to Rawls. I mean, Rawls fought against fascism, right, uh, and bravely in the Second World War uh, and was very, very critical uh, of the way the American uh, system turned towards reactionary politics afterwards, right? So liberal socialism isn't necessarily opposed uh, to revolutionary agitation uh, or pacifistic. Um, it looks at these kind of questions strategically, right? Uh, and again, this relates back to a problem that I think I have sometimes with uh, some people on the Marxist left, uh, which is that I don't think that they are sufficiently Marxist, right? Uh, as you pointed out, uh, Marx points out, like highlights that any transition to communism uh, invariably needs to be understood dialectically and historically, uh, which means that we are not going to have some radical break with what happened before. Uh, instead, there's going to be a transition where the new socialist society that will emerge after capitalism will be, and this is his term, stamped uh, by many features that came before, right? Uh, and this is where I find many leftists who make a fetish out of revolution as this idea of a kind of event uh, where everything is going to be changed in almost a messianic way, uh, I find it very anti-Marxist in many ways. And I think Igor points this out brilliantly uh, in his book, uh, which, you know, people want the title. It's Karl Marx's Critique of Liberalism, uh, or revisiting, excuse me, Karl Marx's Critique of Liberalism. Uh, in terms of what liberal socialism would look like uh, and what its theoretical bases are in general, uh, I would argue that liberal socialism is committed to three core principles, right? Uh, the first principle is the most abstract, and then I'll move to the more concrete. 
but the first principle is that liberal socialists are committed to methodological collectivism and normative individualism uh, in the sense that all liberal socialists appreciate that social theory uh, is extremely important and that we need to recognize that human flourishing is only possible in a social setting, right? That you know, the free development of each is contingent upon the free development of all. Uh, nonetheless, they're normative individualists in the sense that we think that ultimately the individual, whether you know human or animal, uh, is the source should be the source of our normative concern, uh, and it's their flourishing that's important, right? Uh, not the flourishing of say abstract entities like the nation, right, uh, or society as a whole. Uh, the second core principle that I would argue liberal socialists are committed to uh, is a developmental rather than a possessive or acquisitive ethic, uh, and this is a point that's really stressed by the really remarkable Canadian political theorist C. B. McPherson, who was the main theoretical influence on my book, uh, I should add. I basically plagiarized his title, you know, The Political Theory of Possessive Individualism, The Political Theory of Liberal Socialism. Uh, but the distinction here is that an acquisitive ethic uh, focuses on this idea that the point in life is to acquire capital uh, for the gratification of your hedonic needs as a, you know, atomistic individual. Uh, well, all liberal socialists reject this, right? Going back again to Paine and Wollstonecraft, uh, but this is most clearly articulated in Mill and Rawls and a variety of others, where they say, look, uh, the point of human life isn't to acquire and gratify urges. Uh, it's to develop your human powers or your human capacities, as it's sometimes called, uh, in conjunction with others through the formation of innovative or experimental solidaristic forms of life uh, that are gratifying and meaningful. Uh, now, what this looks like, all liberals will say, will be different depending upon the individual's temperament, personality, aesthetic inclinations, right? Uh, but the space and the resources and the social structures need to be implemented for people to pursue uh, this developmental ethic in a way that makes sense to them uh, and is sufficiently pluralistic, right? Uh, now, the third major principle that liberal socialists are committed to, I argue at least, uh, is this idea that we should retain respect for many liberal institutions and liberal rights. Uh, with the exception of any right to private property uh, that moves beyond the auspices of personal property. Uh, and this needs to be tied by the insight that what we need to do is extend liberal principles of equality for all and freedom of all, freedom for all uh, to the market uh, in a way that classical liberals, for instance, uh, would have found shocking uh, or impermissible. People like Ludwig von Misa, who's really the villain of my book, I should say, right? Uh, and, you know, all liberal socialists have made this claim, right, that what we need to do uh, is democratize the market in certain kinds of foundational ways um, by ultimately uh, ending the rule of capital uh, over individuals, uh, which is in the long run going to mean, or even in the short run, uh, getting rid of the capitalist class. Uh, and this is very clear if you read the later editions of Mill's Principles of Political Economy. Uh, as Gary Dorian points out, you know, each edition was more socialist than the last, uh, where Mill says, look, the capitalist class is largely useless, right? Uh, it doesn't do anything except for expropriating capital uh, and, you know, using it to gratify usually very base needs. Uh, workers should seize control of the means of production themselves and produce for themselves, right? Without the need for this expropriative class operating over and above them and perverting or distorting uh, their capacity to form solidaristic and individualistic relationships. Uh, and I have problems with Mill's argument for this, right? Um, but you know, every liberal socialist would be very sympathetic uh, to that position. So in terms of its practical instantiation, uh, there are a lot of different proposals that have been put forward concerning what liberal socialism would look like, right? Uh, and I don't wanna speak for everybody in the tradition uh, because again, you know, part of my book uh, is saying, you know, this is what this person believed and this is what that person believed. And here's why I think they were a little bit more on the right track and they were a little bit more on the wrong track. Uh, myself, and again, I'm only speaking for myself, uh, I would argue that the way that we could start approximating something like liberal socialism uh, would be transitioning to a cooperative mo like model uh, of economic organization uh, where workers implement a kind of market socialism uh, by getting rid of the capitalist class and seizing control of the means of production for themselves, producing for themselves. Uh, and this should be complemented by extensive forms of welfareism. Uh, of the sort that we haven't seen, certainly since the 1950s or 60s, uh, but even going beyond that, right? Uh, and I take this idea largely from uh, Thomas Piketty's, or the set of ideas, right? Uh, latest book, uh, A Brief History of Equality. Uh, beyond, you know, these kinds of initial steps, uh, I have no problem saying that we can be more ambitious uh, as time goes on uh, and maybe look to eliminating private ownership of the means of production wholesale. 
right? Uh, but here again, I would reference Marx and say, uh, I don't want to speculate too much about this uh, because I think transitioning to a cooperative or co-determination model of economic organization in the firm uh, and establishing an extensive welfare state would push us in the direction of democratic socialism and the democratization of the economy. Uh, beyond that, well, we need to look at material circumstances and political circumstances at play uh, and try to think about what further steps could be uh, for future generations. So your your agent here, so you're, you're, I mean, it is an interesting point that you're not necessarily anti-revolutionary per mm -hmm. se. Um, I mean, there is, there is this- yeah, Fuck the fascists always. <laughs> there's a wonderful point that in the second international from the um, turn into the 20th century um, in say Germany, um, the socialist party had like um, two or three different theories of revolution. Mm -hmm. One of them was simply if the socialists get the majority in the parliamentary system, that itself would be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Another one was this kind of more mystical idea of a grand insurrection, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, so these, uh, <laughs> these two, 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 I mean, there's all of this kind of question that, that I think we're looking at now in a post-2008 context after the Arab Spring, after Occupy Wall Street, after the collapse of Corbyn and Sanders, you know, we both have seen the failure of spontaneous mm -hmm. insurrections, street protests, as delivering uh, some egalitarian up change in the system. And we've also seen the failure of these more social democratic mm -hmm. um, figures to upend the system. So we're at a certain deadlock right now. And so I wanted to ask you, um, also, we have a history on the new left of mm -hmm. advocating for a commune-based and a collective-based form of worker management and so on. Uh, I think in here of Eric Olin Wright, mm -hmm. um, Eric Olin Wright, the an analytical Marxist, was big on this. And I think that it's, you know, those proposals, and I've had um, Raju Das, who wrote a book on Marx's class theory, come onto the show, and his push against Eric Olin Wright is that this actually doesn't address the question of power, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, we're, we're caught in the, the question of transition and, and, and um, contestation of class power. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was wondering, um, I was wondering what you think about this. In other words, is liberal socialism sort of an effort or does it rather imply an effort at a, on a practical level? of a kind of, yeah, like let's get on the inside of the professional managerial class and the bureaucratic class mm -hmm. and show them that in order to stay true to the values that they espouse, <laughs> we need to have a kind of educational reform revolution within that. Like what's your, have you thought much about the class strategy and the educational strategy that's needed here? Um, you know what I mean? Like how you might prioritize yep. that, right? Um, because I think it's really a question of your vision of liberalism after everything we've talked about for the last hour and 12 minutes is so different than these neoliberal, like, um, you know what I mean? It's like night and day. It's night and day. And, you know, your vision makes them look like reactionary liberals. And of course they are. Oh, yeah. In my, and that also means that a lot of progressive liberals who have market fundamentalist beliefs or believe that the market is this magical thing, well, actually, that that is kind of reactionary if you really hold that view. Mm -hmm. But Matt, the question is, how are you going to convince them of what you this vision? It, what what like, how do you change the the zeitgeist of the bureaucratic class that is the kind of class that capital relies on for mm -hmm. maintaining the stability of the system in some ways? seems to me that that's the number one question almost of like an ideological educational mission and so on and obviously you believe in this because you're writing op-eds jacobin and other places popular outlets so you believe in that mission of education but maybe one way to ask the question more pointedly would be like are you at all optimistic that we can muster the type of change in consciousness and what, what might that look like and what might be the kind of class strategy and the solidarities needed for for doing that i'm not sure if you've thought much about that but i think about that all the time i have and i have thought about it uh, a lot myself right um i mean i was at the uiw strike uh a couple months ago uh and i was really inspired by things like that and i do think that 
uh, what we've seen in you know the hot labor summer uh, over the last couple of years uh, makes me a little bit more hopeful uh, than I was before. Uh, although, of course, we have the specter of the big orange menace uh, looming over us that also fills me with a bit of dread. Um, so I'll, I'll break this into three categories, right? One uh, is, you know, how I feel about the contemporary moment. The second is, what do I think theorists like myself can do? Uh, and then second, what can more practically minded people do? Because, you know, I'm my own, my own limitations, and I don't really have as much of interest to say about this, but, you know, I'll take a stab at it, right? Uh, in terms of our contemporary moment, I do think there are reasons for cautious optimism, right? Uh, and the biggest reason for this is actually if you look at the political right right now. Uh, and I know that might seem like an odd thing to say, uh, but Margaret Thatcher once said that her greatest accomplishment, and many people on the left know this, uh, wasn't you know, destroying the British unions uh, or saying all the nasty things she did about the welfare state or the Falkland Islands War. Uh, it was Tony Blair because she had convinced new labor to change their mind uh, on socialism. Well, what we're seeing with the American right right now is them becoming increasingly critical of capitalism, uh, arguing that major reforms need to be undertaken. Uh, and you're already, you're even starting to see a couple of conservatives, uh, you know, J.D. Vance, Josh Hawley, uh, you know, Saurabh Amari, uh, Patrick Deneen, saying that we need more economic egalitarianism. Now, of course, this is going to be accompanied by all kinds of social conservatism that I think are extraordinarily unpalatable. And I want to stress, I do not support these people in any way, shape, or form, right? But what I do think it indicates is a hegemonic shift towards this idea that neoliberalism uh, is just not going to do it for anybody any longer. And I think the fact that you see the left and the right agreeing on that is a clear indication of this. Uh, and of course, I want the left uh, to be the new kind of hegemony uh, that replaces neoliberalism, right? Uh, rather than, you know, these new forms of post-liberalism or reactionary politics. So that gives me a cautious bit of optimism, right? Because, because you also then see that that's an opportunity for solidarity and breaking up the ideological silos so that you know, and I mean, this is a huge debate on the left, like you have the existence of uh, Amari's compact magazine. And for most Marxists, it's like, don't publish there, don't interact with them. This is this is the signs of some kind of burgeoning fascism. I think those critiques are a little hyperbolic. Um, uh, but are you suggesting that this isn't how is this positive? Because it opens a possibility of the collapse of neoliberalism and its legitimacy and solidarity with these forms um, with the left? How, like, how does that work? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't say solidarity uh, in any way, shape, or form. Right? I mean, I had a debate with Saurabh uh, three weeks ago. We met in person. Uh, you know, he's a nice guy, but I don't agree with him uh, about a huge amount, and that's just going to stay that way, right? Uh, except the bad action movies. We both like Terminator 2, so that's nice. Uh, but long story short, right, what I think it indicates isn't an opportunity for solidarity, uh, but a shift in the hegemonic expectations of people, right? Uh, and again, this is parallel to what we saw with Margaret Thatcher in the 1990s, where she talked about how the new left had changed its mind uh, on the question of neoliberalization, right? I think that if we are seeing people on the right starting to say we need economic egalitarianism, that is an indication that the left argument against neoliberalism uh, that we've been making far longer than the right is gaining general traction, Um both, you know, in uh, you know uh, the broader bo uh, like the broader body politic, uh, and in the intellectual class. And what I think we need to do is mobilize this discontent that's emerging about neoliberalism uh, to try to advance progressive causes to make sure that it's not the right uh, that seizes this moment to advance a more kind of reactionary politics. That's all I'm suggesting. This very Gramscian point about possibilities uh, emerging that would have been precluded uh, in the 1990s, where, as you know, Sijek says. Even you know the most radical leftists were kind of crypto uh, Fukuyamas, right? You know, the end of history has happened. Uh, there's no chance that we can change, so we just have to kind of uh, accept things. Now, in terms of what theorists like myself or yourself can do uh, to try to abet uh, transition away from neoliberalism towards the left and not the right, um, I think that some of what you can we can do uh, is just write books like you and I do, right? Uh, that are pitched at uh, both an academic and hopefully a more popular audience, uh, try to make the intellectual case uh, for what it is that we are, you know, think is palatable. Uh, but I also think that one of the things that needs to shift uh, is theorists, right, uh, need to be a lot less afraid uh, of being public facing uh, and writing things in an accessible way. Uh, so here I agree with my friend Ben Burgess and uh, his book, Canceling Comedians While the World Burns. Uh, where he points out that in the 1980s and the 1990s, there is this real sense of defeatism uh, that pervaded the socialist left and the left more generally. Uh, and one of the things that occurred consequently uh, is 
left theory retreated into the academy, into the art schools, into the realm of aesthetics, uh, where the kind of values that are advocated for uh, are things like creativity, profundity, uh, difficulty, originality, that kind of stuff, right? Now, of course, I endorse all of these things, right, intellectually. But I think that when we are public facing, uh, it's a lot more important to stress things like democratic transparency or lucidity, right? Uh, because the reality is, you know, writing some dense book uh, about Lacanian theory uh, is not going to mobilize many people in the working class, even though I think it's a valuable contribution to make. So I'm not knocking it, right? Uh, and, you know, I've written dense books on postmodernity, drawing upon, you know, psychoanalysis. So I understand that. Uh, so I think that left intellectuals need to be willing to do what Marx himself did, right? Which is to write the dense theory books uh, that are important for making the most strong and compelling intellectual case uh, in, you know, whatever terms we need, uh, while at the same time appreciating that a second genre of presentation is necessary. That is public face and democratic uh, and tries to present these ideas in a far more accessible way, uh, in the way that Marx himself was capable of, or Engels for that matter, right? Uh, and I try to do my best on that front, and I know many other people do. You know, I'm not knocking anyone, uh, but I like to see a lot more of that, if possible. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think the limit for me is the cultivation of a public discourse that is committed to a rigorous general facing, um, multidisciplinary, intellectual Absolutely. vocation, right? That is not necessarily reliant on the academy in all of its specialization. Because no. I mean, that's part of the reason why I do this podcast and bring on perspectives from sociologists, historians, philosophers, political scientists, and so on, is because I think that as somebody committed to the socialist tradition, um, it is it is a tradition that is highly intellectually engaged and like somebody was saying recently that the last time that the Western civilization had, say even in the United States, a intellectual uh, discourse in which we could actually um, envision the function of the intellectual as a general uh, intellectual was, was actually the time of Edmund Wilson, right? <laughs> and so there was a time in which intellectuals kind of fully, which was what, which was actually pre-World War II, right? Mm -hmm. in, in between the wars and early 20th century. So we have really lost something in in the contemporary intellectual discourse, and I, yeah, I think I think that um, um, there's also limits to um, this, you know, lucidity without being commodified oh, yeah. is also important. Um, um, so, so keeping that keeping that kind of general complexity is also an invitation to people to enter into and not be afraid of concepts in some sense, um, which is something my show tries to do. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just want to say here, I go back and forth on this myself, right? Because I agree with the Adornian point uh, that the problem with any idea that can be clearly expressed is that it can be very easily commodified, right? Uh, and that it can also be instinctively reactionary, right? Since if you are just expressing an idea that is clear, uh, then it very well might just conform to the hegemonic common sense uh, of the era, right? Uh, at the same time, right, I, I also point out that Adorno uh, had a lot of reactionary impulses precisely because he was so fixated on being intellectually rarefied, engaging in these great debates about uh, being, you know, an ontology. Yep. Uh, and that might not necessarily be the kind of intellectual activism that we need at this moment. So uh, I think that a writer, again, aside from Marx, uh, who is really good uh, at reconciling these together uh, would be somebody like, say, Wendy Brown, right? Uh, who is really, really very, very p good at writing in a lucid way that doesn't sacrifice profundity uh, or anti-hegemonic kind of um, rhetorics and aesthetics, right? Uh, and, you know, everyone can take their pick here. Uh, but to your last question about, like, um, what can we done practically, right, in terms of, you know, not just intellectual activity, but more generally, uh, there I don't have any very good answers, right? In part for the reasons that you mentioned, right? Uh, it would seem that militant activism has gotten us some of the way, uh, and social democratic agitation through the party system has also gotten us another part of the way. Uh, but you know, the reality is that the Bernie Sanders campaign was you know a major accomplishment in 2016 and 2020. Uh, but you know, he's not the president, so you know, there's only so far that it went right. Uh, I what I would like to see in the future would be something that could be comparable to say the Great Compact uh, that took place in the Nordic countries uh, in the 1920s, right? Uh, because there's often this kind of Blase attitude taken towards Nordic social, social democracy, uh, where people, including especially on the right, will say, well, you know, there's a kind of, you know, 
solidarity that always existed in these countries. Uh, and, you know, that's why these social democratic parties were very successful in taming capital. Uh, people forget that actually Sweden uh, in the 19th century was one of the most aristocratic and fundamentally unequal societies in the entire world. Uh, it had a very powerful, very burgeoning market, uh, Marxist uh, movement that was actually able to unite farmers and industrial workers in a way that very few Marxist movements have uh, on the basis that we need to get rid of the aristocracy, uh, establish political democracy and transition to socialism. Uh, and these movements were so successful that eventually in the 1920s, uh, they enacted what's sometimes called the Great Compact or the Great Compromise, uh, which was a transition away from capitalist domination and aristocratic domination of the economy towards the social democratic form that proved extremely popular. Uh, and this was a bit like um, the result of militant activism uh, on a lot of people's parts. Now, I'm familiar with all the criticisms of Nordic social democracy, and I do agree with many of them, right? Uh, particularly the fact that it is dependent upon uh, the super exploitation of the third world, right? Uh, Mark Hadlin makes this point very brilliantly, right? Uh, nonetheless, I think that this kind of alignment between Industrial workers, intellectuals, farmers, right, uh, was extremely successful in getting us a lot of the way uh, from, you know, aristocratic forms of capitalism. And there's nothing wrong with looking at it uh, as a model uh, for a transition to a kind of liberal socialist state. So that's the kind of thing that I've been dwelling a little bit on right now. Uh, whether conditions for such a thing are present in the United States at this point or Canada, you know, where I'm from, uh, yeah. I don't know, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think this has been a really interesting conversation, and there's a lot to chew on. I'm going to have to re-listen to this and really digest. I'm excited for your argument. Where you divert from Rawls seems pretty clear um, around the property own, uh, owning uh, asset based um, thing, which clearly I think, you know, like if if if, if to connect your point on Thatcher, uh, because people also call Tony Blair um, somebody who instantiated a a version of Rawlsian asset based uh, justice, which is which is crazy to think about. And I'm not going to conflate <laughs> Rawls with Thatcher. Well, although that just is, just to be clear, right? I want to say this. Rawls very rarely made public interventions, which I think was a fault of his, right? Um, mm -hmm. To be fair, he was a very shy man. Uh, you know, that's not a myth. Uh, you know, uh, if you read his biography, he is actually says, you know, I spent most of my time thinking that everybody around me was smarter. And I was kind of astonished uh, that people enjoy theory of justice. Uh, and, you know, there are anecdotes of him, you know, for instance, uh, sitting in faculty rooms, uh, and if you noticed that a student couldn't see well because the sun was in their eyes, he would move his chair to sit in front of it. That's you know how attentive uh, he was. So he just wasn't a public-facing guy. But in Justice's fairness, he does intimate uh, that actually the kinds of welfareism that were established in the 1970s uh, that his book was associated with were not adequate to the realization of Justice's fairness. He's very clear about that, right? Uh, and he also, again, strongly implies that we've moved further away from achieving justice as fairness over the last 40 years. This was in, or 30 years, this was in uh, 2001, right? Uh, rather than moving towards it. So this linking of Rawlsianism with Blairism or Clintonism, uh, I think has always been a very serious mistake, right? Yeah, Bill Clinton yeah. might've had some yeah. nice things to say about Rawls, uh, but yeah. as uh, Sam Moyne pointed out, Rawls's book was never more likely to be achieved uh, than the day before he published it. Yeah, this is helpful. This is helpful. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, in, in thinking about liberal socialism, you know, one of my, I mean, you're helping me with this, and I, I certainly am not signed up. I haven't drank in your Kool-Aid. I'm not sure that I will, although I very res much respect everything you're doing. Thank you. But, you know, part of it, I think also, is the notion that when you adopt this liberal hyphen socialist position, I worry that you lose a certain antagonistic relationship to things like the existence of the ruling class and you end up kind of watering down certain um, distinctions and differences that are both ideological and material about things like what Lukács talked about in Destruction of Reason about how we understand the reality of what capitalism is as a system. And so when we pigeonhole ourselves as liberals, I do worry that we create um, maybe like a pact with, not the enemy, but a pact with elements of people ideologically that that train can quite easily get derailed. So I do worry about that. And I, I do I do worry that there's not enough fortifications mm -hmm. of distinction ideologically to protect our goals. And again, our goals, you know, I do think that some basic Marxist principles are, are goals. And it sounds like, interestingly, I learned in this conversation, 
you actually share a lot of those goals. Like mm -hmm. I would, it sounds like you actually do kind of agree with Marx that um, to revolutionize capitalism, you need to insist on the independent organization of the working class, mm -hmm. right? You, well, okay, that's great. But you know, one of the implications of that is like say in the United States, that also really would mean that you need to be independent from the democratic party. How can a liberal socialism be independent from the democratic party? That seems like a difficult or maybe even a tall order, right? Oh yeah. For a liberal socialist, because you have, so it, it, it almost Matt implies a different theory of, um, alliance of solidarity of education. It, you know, you know what I mean? And that th those are some of the practical things that your this conversation has me thinking about. I'm, I'm not, asking you a question i'm just reflecting you know no you're, you're absolutely right and look i don't have good answers to that right uh, i mean once upon a time i would say hey, if dsa hits five hundred thousand members we should just form a third party uh you know get Cornell west running it or somebody like that uh and then i'd vote for it right um uh, but because absolutely. of absolutely absolutely exactly yeah but because of the institutional makeup of the united states right now uh, it's very hard for third parties to gain traction which is one of the reasons that i think in the short run we can try to push for the democratization of the U.S. institutional system uh, to try to make way for those kinds of movements. But I'd just like to say one thing about antagonism, right? Uh, because I didn't quite answer every aspect of your question about what theorists can do, right? Uh, so I am with Sam Moyne uh, in arguing that what I am doing is a kind of imminent critique of liberalism uh, by reminding liberals that at their best, and I want to stress at their best, right? Uh, they were a revolutionary group that was committed to the ideals of freedom for all, solidarity for all, and above all, equality for all, right? Uh, and in many ways, the liberal tradition uh, fought for those things successfully, right? Uh, if you think about the American, Haitian, and French revolutions. Uh, but liberalism since then uh, has in many ways sold its radical soul to capital. Uh, and as a consequence, in many ways, it is no longer worthy uh, of veneration, uh, our loyalty. Uh, but because I am committed to the idea that there are still many things about the liberal tradition to admire uh, and even lionize, uh, what I want to do through this form of imminent critique is remind certainly progressive liberals uh, that they are, they should be radicals, right? And that to be liberal is to demand these, a commitment to these core principles in a way that is incompatible with capitalism. Uh, whether I'm successful or not, you know, I'll leave to yourself and readers of the book. Uh, but that's the way that I understand my own perspective on this. I like that. Yeah, I'm, I was listening to NPR recently and I heard some people that I would probably characterize as kind of neoliberal centrists talking about the French Revolution and most of the Jacobins as terrorists, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, they, they, they see no ideological similarity between themselves and their own tradition, right? Which is crazy to think it about is. in some way. Um, and this is why Moyne's book is so helpful, right? Where he points out that liberals, specifically, particularly in the 20th century, responding to communism, uh, liquidated uh, their own li revolutionary origins, uh, neglecting, you know, that, you know, George Washington, you know, launched a revolution uh, against the British Empire and that, you know, the French Revolution was fundamentally a bourgeois revolution, first and foremost, right? Uh, and I think that a lot needs to be done uh, to recover the radical core uh, of liberalism if we're going to transition it to something like liberal socialism, should that be desirable to people. Yeah, and not to mention the fact that we live in a kind of general cultural zeitgeist which radicalizes people already through liberal lens. Like I, I've always, I mean, I've written about this a little bit, is like when I first became radical or a leftist, I became kind of an ultra uh, liberal in some sense. Mm -hmm. I laid because I didn't have Marx. And that's the interesting thing about your project for me, right? Mm -hmm. Because when I engaged Marx, it was turning a mirror on myself and on my liberal education in such a radical way that I had to sort of, that I'm still working through, right? That oh, yes. is a constant, right? So anything, the dignity of this hyphenated liberal socialism for me has Marx as what Sartre calls like, um, the, philo the philosopher that we must confront in our time, mm -hmm. right? I just had Terry Pinkard on and he clarified that really well. The Sartre was famous concept from uh, Search for Method, um, which is that still Marx remains the central philosopher that we must contend with in order to live out the Hegelian notion that philosophy is the comprehension of one's own time and thought. Mm -hmm. It still requires Marx. Um, and But I think you've raised a question of, right, well, that confrontation with Marx still leaves liberalism, not in some uh, infantile anarchist thing of like, let's just 
erase liberalism like it doesn't exist. No, but there's this huge tradition which has given us egalitarianism, has given us rights, has given mm -hmm. us this conceptions. Uh, so what do we do with it? Right. And this is this is an interesting this is an interesting conversation. And um, I think we'll close. Uh, real nice to meet you for the first time. And yeah, you thanks too, for coming on the program. And um, hopefully we can do some stuff on Nietzsche in the future. Um, I'd love to actually sit down with you at some point and just like hash out our views on Nietzsche, maybe see where we disagree, see where we agree, things of that nature. That might be fun. Hopefully we can do that in the next year. Yeah, man. Anytime. I had a great time. Uh, and honestly, great questions. I really enjoyed this. Um, a lot of things for me to think about as well. Uh, and like you, you know, I'm still wrestling with a lot of these things. Um, I certainly haven't made my last word uh, on any of these points, uh, but I 100% agree that any liberal, uh, and especially a liberal socialist, uh, needs to take Marx with the most absolute seriousness possible. Uh, and like I said, I'm a Rawlsian Marxist, right? Uh, both of those are theoretically important to me, uh, and I would never, ever slight the guy, uh, even if I think he was a great man who made sometimes great errors. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, please give it five stars on whatever you're listening to this on. Give it a likes and, uh, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, become a member of the Patreon. This will probably be my last program for the year. Happy holidays. And thanks, Matt, for coming on. No Take care, too. everybody.